The Sydney grandmother Karen Nettleton is heading overseas hoping to see her grandchildren. If it happens, it'll be no ordinary family reunion. I need to have my children back. They deserve to come back here. They deserve to be here and happy and safe and have food and be able to walk down the street. Be normal. Karen's three grandchildren and two great-grandchildren have spent the past five years living under the brutal rule of Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. They're the children of the notorious jihadist Khalid Sharouf and his wife Tara. Well, I actually wanted the government to bring them home, but they say they can't, so I'm going to get them and make my way to the refugee camp. Knock on the door and say, I'm Karen Nettleton. I'm the grandmother of the Sharif children. Here are all the documents. I would like to take them home. Karen is flying into Iraq and from there hopes to cross the border into Syria. I just, I don't know what to expect. I just... Tonight, Four Corners follows a grandmother's desperate mission to save her family and bring them home. Nettleton often wonders why her family's simple suburban life took such a drastic turn. Karen raised her only child, Tara, as a single mother in Western Sydney. It was a pretty fun childhood. She had a horse that we kept at Scenic Hills. She had lots of friends. We'd go to the pool, parks, she played tennis. At 15, Tara dropped out of Chester Hill High School, moved out of the mother's house and out of contact. One month later, they arranged to meet at Manly in Sydney. I met them at the wharf, and when she came out, she had um, her Muslim clothes on, the hijab and the long dress. And Tara told me that she'd converted to Islam, and I, could, I knew that because of how she was dressed and that she was married to Khaled and she was having a baby. Must have been quite a shock. It was. It was, but what could I do? She loved him. And if I wanted any sort of relationship with my daughter, I had to accept it all. The father-to-be was 17-year-old labourer Khaled Sharouf, who had a history of drug abuse and undiagnosed mental illness. If you knew then what you know now, would you have behaved differently at that meeting? That's a tough one to answer. Well, the end result would be she'd still be alive. Zainab and who Hey. Having a rest now. Hello, girls. The Shrews had five children. Zainab was first born, followed closely by Hude, Abdullah, Zakawi, and Hamza. Karen doted on them. Well, Zainab was the princess. Hude was the sensitive one. 
And Abdullah in the swing. Abdullah was Abdullah. And Sakoi was the naughty corner boy. Pedal, pedal. Pedal hard, pedal hard. Keep pedaling. And Hamze was just the baby corn. Idolised by everyone. Oh my god, Hamze! <laughs> there was a lot of happy moments. Holidays, just going to the pool with them, going to the park, teaching them to ride their bikes, um, teaching them to swim. There's a lot, lots. Lots and lots of happy times. As a mother, you must have formed some kind of a picture in your head of Tara's life with Khaled. In my head, I just thought it was a bit restrictive, like from an outsider looking in, but it's the way of life for them, and she was quite happy to wear what she wore, go into a different room if there was people over or if his brothers came over. You know, and she was quite happy with her life. Zainab was born in 2001, the year that changed the world. Her father was mixing with hardline extremists, including notorious Muslim cleric Abdul Nasser Bembrika, who stayed at Shrew's house when visiting Sydney. Osama bin Laden, he's a great man. They dig here. One of the men that came was Abdul Nasser Bembrika. Um, and the girls were a bit in awe of him. Um, and they said that he was their Sheik. And me being me just said, what, Shrek? In the early hours of this morning, more than 400 police raided homes in southwest Sydney as part of Australia's biggest counter-terrorism operation. In 2005, Sharouf was arrested in Sydney and pleaded guilty to preparing for a terrorist act. He served four years in prison. These guys, their view was jihad was to kill. That was that simple. It was to kill in God's name or in Allah's name. That was it. I just couldn't imagine that he would have anything to do with a terrorism attack on Australia. He just didn't give off that vibe that he was so extreme to do something like that. In 2012, Khalid Sharouf was centre stage in Sydney protesting against a film that they said insulted the Prophet. Also there was his friend, Mohammed el -Amar. A year later, Sharouf, using his brother's passport, left Australia to join Islamic State along with el -Amar. I didn't know anything about ISIS, not at all. The first I heard about ISIS was from the TV, when they started putting the name ISIS out there in the black flag and go number one. In early 2014, Karen and Tara went on a holiday to Malaysia. Tara then went with her children onto Turkey, but never came home. Can you describe for me that farewell in Malaysia? Oh, it was very sad. I kissed the kids, kissed their faces, hugged them, kissed them again, hugged Tara, kissed her and walked out and left them there. But I didn't know I was saying goodbye to Tara, to Abdullah and to Zakoi when I did that. If I knew, I don't know if I would have gone. Can you describe for me the moment that you realised your family was in Syria? How did you find out? My granddaughter sent a, a picture of her and her brother and she still had the location services on and it came up Raqqa, Syria, from where the photo originated from.
The city of Raqqa became the self-declared capital of the new Islamic State Caliphate in Iraq and Syria. The Sharufs lived in this house before the city was destroyed by coalition airstrikes. From amid the chaos, Tara and the children managed to make contact with their grandma. Hello, Nana. Just wanted to tell you that I love you and miss you. Mum says to tell you we're safe. She loves you and misses you heaps. The two eldest boys, Abdullah and Zakawi, began attending ISIS camps. I don't know why anybody would want to train little boys to fight. I just thought they were camps, like, you know, manning up camps. Because it's not as if they play with toys at that age there. You know, if they were at home, sure. You got quite a few photos of them and you began to see, I think, things that you wouldn't see in Australia in those photos. Oh, my God. Guns leaning up against the wall in photos and ammunition and that was a shock to me to see things like that in pictures and I it would just really stuck out like I'd get a picture of the kids sitting on the couch and behind them because it was a new couch behind them here's this like automatic weapon that just doesn't happen in my world There was worse to come. A child purported to be the son of Australian Islamic State terrorist Khaled Sharouf holding a man's severed head. This image, perhaps even an iconic photograph, uh, is really one of the most disturbing, stomach-turning, grotesque photographs ever displayed of a child holding a severed head up with pride and with, this, with, the, with the support and encouragement of a parent. That was the worst picture I've ever seen. I can't imagine someone doing something like that to someone else and then holding it up as a trophy. Like, that's just wrong. And I was so angry about that picture because it's going to follow him everywhere for the rest of his life. It's always going to be there. Whenever you Google the name Sharouf, that picture comes up. Any time there's a, an article about them in the paper, that picture's used. A year after arriving, Khaled Sharouf arranged for his eldest daughter, 13-year-old Zainab, to marry his friend Mohammed El Amar. Soon after, she was pregnant. Oh my God, that was just unbelievable. Here is a man as old as her father, and here she is 13. My opinion of it was disgust. Three months later, Elamar was killed in an airstrike. Early reports said Sharouf had also died. Both of them were terrorists. Uh, both of them uh, uh, are evil. These two men are not martyrs. They are criminal thugs who've been carrying out uh, brutal terrorist attacks, uh, putting people's lives in danger. The reports of Sharouf's death were wrong. In 2015, Tara fell ill with severe stomach pains and was taken to a hospital in Mosul in Iraq. Tara wanted to leave, but Abdullah didn't, and so she couldn't go without her son. She couldn't leave him there. So that stopped one attempt of coming home. A few months later, Tara died of what was believed to have been a perforated intestine. I got a text message, and the text message said that Aisha had passed. And that was in January. Aisha? That was Tara's Muslim name, Aisha. And that I said, when did it happen? What, what are you talking about? And I don't know who it was actually that 
was texting, I think it might have been Khaled, um, and she died on the 21st of September 2015, and I was told in the January 2016. And what Hilda has since told me was that he was carrying her when she was dead, trying to get help for her and screaming at the doctors to do something. <laughs> and it was holes in her intestines that killed her. Something that could have been treated here at home. I still can't believe I've lost my child. <sighs> After her death, Tara's children made a video tribute to their mother. I just cried through the whole video. Hood Air had made it. And it was just flashes of scenes of everyone. I only watched it once. I can't watch it again. It's just too sad. It was beautiful and I'm glad she sent it to me, but I can't watch it. In early 2016, Karen decided to travel to Turkey to try to rescue her grandchildren, accompanied by her lawyer and friend, Robert Van Olst. I'd never thought I'd be in this situation, ever. Ever. I mean, trying to get children out of Syria? I'm just a grandma from the suburbs. <laughs> Turkey was in the midst of a wave of attacks carried out by ISIS in retaliation for its role in the Syrian war. I was down there when it all started. So what actually happened? Well, it was a bomb. In a cafe in Istanbul, Karen and Rob waited for news of the children. Karen had been trying to send them money so they could escape. As they waited, Karen received a terrifying text message from Zainab. Oh, Jesus. Thanks a lot, Nana. They just hit the place we were supposed to get the money from. My friend's husband and Abdullah were there. I still haven't heard if they are alive or dead. Twelve rockets. It was a setup. They're liars. I can't believe this, my God. What is she? Is she saying to yeah. me, thanks a lot? As like it's my fault? Oh, I don't think that. I don't think so. I'm shaking, I'm so scared. <laughs> I've got a pace, I've got a pace. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nana. And she's saying... No, but don't, you've got to ignore that, Karen. We have to just keep focused. She's only a kid. She's in a terrible situation. She, she's just beside herself, fear and anger. It's quite normal. So. I can't wait to get rid it. Oh, no. Oh, no. What? Is it, Abdul is it Abdullah? Mm-mm. She doesn't want to come out now, does she? No. 
she wants, she's not going to contact us anymore. And thank you, Colette Ruth, for taking my daughter's life and my grandkids. Fucking much. <sighs> the rescue mission was a failure, and Karen came home without the children. Tonight, Australia's most infamous terrorist, Khaled Sharouf, killed in the Middle East. Sharouf and his wife took their children into a war zone, and if they have been killed, well, what other outcome would they expect? Uh, they are obviously horrible people. Good evening, Juanita Phillips with ABC News. In August 2017, Sharif was killed in an airstrike with his two eldest sons. US airstrike in Syria. So there was a day I lost up to Lorenzo Corey. It's like the drone had taken out of the car, Colette and the two boys. And why they had to get him when he was with the boys, I'd really like to know why. My view of Carla Sharouf is that he was a very bad person, an evil person. Uh, he put himself first before his family and when I was shown a photo to identify him shortly after his own, uh, there'd been an attack and half his face was blown off, I had no feelings of sadness or remorse other than for the children. Over the next year, US, Iraqi and Kurdish forces waged a fierce offensive to recapture ISIS territory. Karen's contact with her grandchildren was patchy and sometimes there was no contact for months. Then came a plea from 16-year-old Hude begging to come home. Late last year, Karen decided to mount another rescue mission this time using smugglers who promised to deliver Hude safely to Turkey. What do you pack for a 16-year-old? I have no idea. I don't even know if she's going to like half this stuff. Jeans, can't go wrong with jeans. I'm trying to pack the least clinging clothes I can think of. We travelled to Turkey with Karen in October 2018. Hey. Hey. How you doing? Good, come in. Thanks. It wasn't long before the rescue plan derailed. I was told that everything's been called off. Oh, man. Because the people who were going to rescue her put the price up by quite a bit. Equivalent of about a hundred thousand dollars, you Australian. How can I tell her they want more money for her? I've never told her. She said, "How much is it costing?" I've just said, "Baby, you're priceless to me." After a day of negotiation, Karen was still no closer to getting Hude out. It won't be long now, okay? Okay. And then we can I'm look. So sick of being I know. I, mean, it won't, I promise you it won't be long. I don't know what to 
doing myself anymore. I'm scared it's not gonna work and I wanna put my steps to do. Right. Every single time I see someone, they ask me, why don't you want to get married? Do you want to get married? This and that. And they ask me about marriage and I don't know what. And I can't just say, I don't even want to be here. I'm not free to say that here. It's not going to be long, I promise. And we'll get you out of there. <laughs> And don't be sorry, don't you ever be sorry, ever. Okay. It's gonna happen and I just <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh god. Oh, let's shut the net off. Oh god. You okay? The fucking religion. Fucking religion. Once again, the rescue mission failed and Karen came home alone. She had a breakdown and had to spend a fortnight in hospital. Thank you. By March this year, the last ISIS enclave was captured and thousands of ISIS fighters, their wives and children, fled. Many of the women and children were rounded up and taken to the Al Hol refugee camp in Syria. Karen didn't know if her grandchildren were dead or alive. I just came out of hospital on the Thursday and then the Friday night I get a phone call from Hori telling me she's in the refugee camp, El Hal refugee camp. I could not believe it. And then to get the call from Zainab, it took a couple of days for Zainab because she had to be processed. Um, but getting her call was... Uh, being told she was there to actually hearing her voice was just... I just knew they were all safe, they will all be together. Three weeks ago, Karen arrived in Erbil in Iraq on her third attempt to rescue the children. Might take a few attempts at the camp to get them, but they're Australian citizens, they're orphans. The government should have them on a plane and bring them home. As soon as Karen arrives at her hotel, she calls Zainab at the refugee camp. Well, I'm in Erbil. We're just waiting on getting permission to come into Syria, and we're hoping to get that either tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, so all things going to plan. No, all things going to plan. We should be there in a few days at the camp. Okay, I love you. I love you too, and I can't wait to hug you and kiss you and squeeze you and <laughs> and I'm so close, baby. I'm so close. Love you. Bye. Bye bye bye. It's going to be the most exciting day. I'm going to be in the same country as my grandkids. For the first time in five years and two months. So it's a big day. And I'm so excited. 
The next step, I think, is just getting over the border in to get them, which will be a bit of a challenge in itself, but just a step at a time. The journey from Erbil to the Syrian border takes two hours and then another three hours to the Kurdish town of Kamishli, which is near the Al Hol refugee camp. I just hope today is the day I get them. If not, we'll try again tomorrow, then the next day. Because I'm not going home this time without them. Definitely not. Just here are the hills of Syria, right? Oh my God, we're nearly there. ABC News, Australia. ABC News, Australia. Oh my God, no! On the approach to the border, there's another delay. We can't cross because the water's too high. Hello? They wait for the water to recede. As they cross the Tigris River into Syria, Karen is having a panic attack. The day ends at the Syrian town of Kamishli, not far from the refugee camp. Karen receives a text from Zainab. Please, Nana, try and come tomorrow, even if it's raining, because we physically and emotionally can't take this anymore. It's too hard. I'm crying myself to sleep because it, this is the first time I felt like I'm in a prison. Please, Nana, I beg you, I can't wait another day. I'm losing my mind. White soap, head lice, um, custody papers, copies of their passports. There you go. Thank you. Oh my God. Is this the bag that's going? Yeah, just jump, tuck the socks off the top. Yeah. Bottom. Yeah. So I find that bag. Where did you go? I've been putting it. What? Thank you. The next day, permission is granted to enter the Al Hall refugee camp. Four Corners is travelling with Karen. According to our information, according they tell me, you are last uh, journalist with them. You alright? No. Are you, um, is it because of the rush this morning? Because yes, and just... I don't care for pressure. Sorry? I can't cope with well, pressure, and this is real pressure.
More than 70,000 people are living in the camp. It seems like an impossible task to find the children. You know where Australians are? No? Looking for Australians. Huh? Uh, Zainab, Sharouf. You know where Australians are? <laughs> Australians? Australians? Yes, Zainab, who did? No, I'm not Australian. Zainab? who did? Sharouf. Huh? Sharouf. I know there's some yeah, Australian, yeah, I know but her. I don't know where the tent is. She must be around this end? The area. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, no you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Two children, her sister, her brother. Pude! Zainab Sharouf! Australian Zainab Sharouf, I'm her grandma. I'm trying to find her. Zainab Sharouf! Zainab Pude Sharouf! Finally, Karen sees a familiar face. No, 
number two, number three. Much too. Oh my god. This is surreal over here. You're not I'm gonna dreaming. Wake up. You're not gonna wake up. I'm so scared I'm gonna wake up. Who's I next? What is that the internet? She just wants to go speak to you. Okay. Please don't move. Please don't move. You're we'll gonna stay leave. here with you until we can? Yeah, yeah. Okay, please, that's better. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is Hude. <laughs> Hude was only 11 when she arrived in Syria. Did you know you were coming from Hude? No. I didn't know I was in Syria until, until after we crossed the borders. And I heard people speaking Arabic. So that's when I was a little bit weird. I asked my mum where we were. And she told me we were in Syria. <laughs> I started crying. <laughs> what did you say to her? I told her, when the hell are we getting back home? Did you even know at that point? I didn't, I didn't know what Syria, I didn't know where we were actually in Syria. I just thought we were in Syria, just in Syria. I thought we could get out <coughs> whenever we wanted to, but you can't, once you get in, you're stuck. <coughs> Did you ask to come home? Yeah. Every five seconds. <laughs> Mummy was planning that though, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. Mm. She, she promised me. Yeah. So many times. Yeah, I know. Yeah. What did she say to you? She told me, I'm going to get you back home, don't worry. She kept saying that until... Until... Until she died. The last time she told me that was actually in the hospital. And she told me, we really have to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you're here. Oh my God. I wasn't gonna give up. I feel like you're the only thing I, left I have of my mother. You're like, you're like a mum sent. I just wanted to see you again for that, like, one purpose. It's been so hard these past five years. I oh, know, baby girl, I oh, know. I know. No. It's been so hard. You've been so brave. I don't know how you've done it. I really don't, but you have. And now your life can start all over again. It'll be a different life. When do you think we'll get back home? When? Well, we're going to have to go to probably Turkey first because we have to yeah. get papers for the girls. Um, Zainab may have to have a baby there. Depends on how quickly we get our papers, yeah. and then we'll be back, going back. Okay. I just want to get out of Syria. Yeah. Next, Zainab arrives. I missed you too. Oh my god, how are you going? Yeah, 
this is what I've been waiting for. Just this feeling, you know, just this, this, God, this. Five years, two months. It's not a dream. <laughs> Everybody knows I'm here to get you out. But it's just going to take a little time. It's not going to be long at all. It's not going to be like a month. Or no, 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 no. It'll take a few days. Yeah. A few days, okay? A few days. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is the bag of stuff I bought with me. Oh, well, and you get to keep the case. Oh, great. Okay, let's have a look in here. Let's see what we've got. Slippers. <laughs> look what Nana got. Oh my God. We've got Skittles. Fredos. Remember the Fredos up there? Flakes and. The smallest one I could find. <laughs> and there's a bag for um, Zainab and a bag for Hodea. I, I, I think it, I've got the same sizes, but anyway, it's the same thing, so I'll still wear the matching. Dear Hamza, this is a headlight, special headlight. Now you turn that on. Let me see. Oh, look, see it's on. I think you press these. Okay? You can wear it on your head if you want to. Even inside, the girls are reluctant to remove their veils because wearing the niqab is strictly enforced by ISIS followers in the camp. That <laughs> Karen's meeting her great grandchildren for the first time. He's, he's disappointed. Conditions in the camp are squalid, and dozens of children have died here. Zerte. <laughs> Um, Panadol for the girls, diarrhea tablets, oh. Panadols um, and that um, hydrate stuff. Thank you so much. OK. Karen's main concern is for Zainab, who's seven and a half months pregnant. Are you worried about giving birth in the camp? I think that's my biggest fear now, is to give birth here. Because I've heard a lot of stories of people giving birth inside their tent and a lot of them haven't worked out, like, properly. So it's, yeah, it's a big fear for me because I'm scared of that. Being children that have died. Some children have made it, some children have died. And it's not a big chance that they'll live. Not a big chance. Zainab describes how they arrived at the camp after a harrowing journey from Baguz. I think those are probably days we'll probably never forget. They were really hard. We were living in um, trenches and there was bullets flying past our heads, explosives exploding all over next to our tents. Yeah, it took us 12 hours to get to the camp. And we were through the night. They didn't give us blankets in the cars or anything. It was really, really freezing. It's a cold. I thought I was going to die from the cold. I said, I'm going to die in this truck with my, with my kids. They had not, I had nothing to cover them with. I had nothing to cover myself with. Karen still has no idea how she'll get the children out of the camp. OK, well, Robert and I have been having meetings with the government about probably twice a month ever since you've gone to just try and get you back. Um, we don't get a yes or no answer. Um, all, all they've said is that once we get to <laughs> Turkey, they'll give us all the help that they can. Uh, medical, dental, um, physio, anything that we need. Um, we have to get DNA tests for your girls, which will take a little while, so you may have your baby in Turkey. 
Yeah. Yeah. Rather than having it in the camp. Yeah. Well, you won't be having it in the camp. I hope so. And then um, after that, once we get the papers, we can all travel back to Australia. How we get back, whether it's on a commercial... But it may not be that simple. Kurdish authorities have to sign off on their release and they're waiting for authorisation from the Australian government. We've been wanting to come home for a very long time, but we were just scared because we've heard a lot of rumours about um, people that leave. People get raped, tortured, they get caught by other people. That's why we, we never actually had the heart to leave. A lot of politicians, you know, have said things like, I wouldn't want my children going to school with them, you know, that, that these people have essentially forfeited their right to be Australian. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that we weren't the ones that chose to come here in the first place. I mean, we were brought here by our parents, and, and now that our parents are gone, we, we want to live, and if for me and my children, I want to live a normal life just like anyone would want to li live a normal life. OK, bye-bye. Nana's going to come soon, OK? Nana's going to come soon, my darling. Hamza, just, I won't kiss you in front of your friends. Just give me five. Love you and I'll be back. The government should have them on a plane and bring them home. Oh, soon, Bubby, soon. They didn't go there of their own choice. They were taken there. They shouldn't be there. I'm not going to put one Australian life at risk to try and extract people from these dangerous situations. I, don't th I think Australians would certainly support that. I think it's appalling that Australians have gone and fought against our values and our way of life and peace-loving countries of the world in joicing, joining the Daesh fight. I think it's even more despicable that they put their children in the middle of it. Karen's been told she can't return to the camp then she receives a distressing message. Um, it says, hi, Nana, it's Hudair. I know you're trying your best, but please, we need you. I think Zainab is giving early birth. She's bleeding. I don't know what to do. It's getting harder. Please try to be here as soon as possible. And I've just said, I'm trying so hard to get you out. It's not easy as I thought it would be. I'm meeting with people to make this happen as quickly as possible. I want to um, seek some approval to take immediate custody um, of these orphan children and, in, and to ensure they've got access to proper medical care. And I just want to stress at this point, we're not seeking to repatriate the children, just removal from the camp and into my custody. I think they should be doing more to help me get the children back, get them back into Australia. I would have liked to have seen them as soon as they knew they were in the camp to start the process to get them back. OK, thank you. Bye. Prime Minister Scott Morrison appears to be softening his position. Where there are uh, particularly children, um, then we are working with the Red Cross that where they're in a position for people to get to a place where they might be in a position to return to Australia, uh, then we will uh, cooperate with that process. Well, the government has said that they will provide all of those, like the de-radicalisation and any assistance that we need in getting the children back into, into society. They'll help us do that. And they're not a, a threat or a danger to anyone. They're not. I mean, Zainab's a mum, 17 years old. Two children, one on the way. Come, there's a little boy, eight. His main worry is his friends. And Hudair is the quiet one. She's, she's the real soft one. Just because their last name is Sharif doesn't mean they're monsters.
Are my children at a risk to Australia? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No way. There's good news when Karen learns Zainab's condition has improved. She's fine. Yep, she's fine. Zainab's been diagnosed with a urinary tract infection, but Karen's still worried. If she stays there, she will give birth in the camp. And that just can't happen. Babies die in there. Women die in childbirth there. And she's just 17. I'm going to show you now. Over the next few days, Karen is constantly on the phone and in meetings with Kurdish and Australian authorities, pressing her case to get her family out. Hello? Hey, baby, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, what's up? Finally, the news they've been waiting for. Karen tells Zainab the Australians are working out how to extract the children from Syria. So now it's just a matter of when they're going to take you. Um, yeah. I'm hoping that I'll be with you, but what I think is going to happen is you'll get picked up in an ambulance and they can get you across the border and you'll, right. be, you'll be going through like um, the Assad regime area and the only way for you to do it safely is in an ambulance. So I'm right. hoping that I can go too, um, but they don't know, they don't know. Okay, if you can try and put as much pressure on them as you can to do it, because I'm really scared. Okay. And don't, don't tell anyone else that you're going to be leaving, because they might get jealous. It's now ten days since Karen arrived in Syria. That camp is just disgusting. That's awful. Yeah. Yeah, somebody was killed there yesterday. It just seems to me it's just taking an extraordinarily long time when they know everything, where the kids are and everything. Australian officials are telling her the children will be released, but she has to be patient. It's unclear how long it'll take. No, well, I'd do anything for them. And I just want it on the record that I'm really frustrated about how long it's taking to get my kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is it. I'm leaving Syria. I didn't think I'd be crossing over without the children, but I am, and I'll be waiting for them on the other side. I just hope it doesn't take too long. 